I recall um, there was a study that people would rather experience physical pain than speak in front of others on average. So fear, everyone is scared of something at some point or other. It's an innate human emotion. Um, usually it's in a response to a danger or a threat, whether it's real or not. But it's basically perception that something bad is going to happen, we become scared of it. What's going to happen that's bad about public speaking? What would happen? Why are we so frightened of this? Why is my pulse rate up right now? That fear, basically, it's very healthy. If you didn't have fear, you'd be in trouble. It stops you from walking in front of a bus because a bus is going to hit me and that's bad. It stops you from picking up a spider and playing with it because, like, you know, what could go wrong with that? Uh, different fears manifest in different people. Um, some people have their own set phobias, others don't. For myself, um, I'm really bad with heights. My wife is really bad with spiders. Like, don't put me too close to the ledge over there, otherwise I'll start trembling a bit. Um, some things are inherently scary. Get up your shoulder mug in there, This is basically the most frightening thing ever. The animals have picked up weapons and are using them against us. <laughs> <laughs> it's using the knife, this is what's so frightening. <laughs> is it painted? Huh? No, it's just the markings on the oh. crown. The animals have arisen. It's bad. Regular expressions may invoke similar kinds of fear in people. We've all got our own little quirks about what scares us or not. I have no fear of regular expressions, which makes me weird. Actually, there's a whole series on these. I, I love every yeah. single last one of them. I could have just sat here tonight and flicked through them and laughed. But yeah. So what's it like not to have any fear at all? There is one person, what are we, six billion on Earth? Seven? Seven, seven, seven. billion? One person known to science who has no fear. She had a problem with her amygdala, because that's what's in your brain that controls fear. Uh, She's known as SM in the study. Um, she has absolutely no fear of anything whatsoever. So naturally, since she's known to science, um, she's had a lot of studies done on her to see what she actually does. Um, one of the things they did is they took her to a pet store with lots of exotic creatures in there just to see what would happen. Um, they got her to like get some snakes wrapped around her and all sorts of things. She had to be asked 15 times not to touch the snakes that would kill her because she thought that it looked fun. <laughs> <laughs> so it's got pretty markings, why can't I just pick it up and like what could possibly go wrong? Nothing would work. Um, no problems with spiders whatsoever. Uh, so basically she had to be physically restrained from touching the things in the pet store that would kill her. How she is still alive, I don't know. Um, actually, she's had, uh, if you've ever gone through any kind of therapy, one of the main things they do for you is cognitive behaviour therapy. And that teaches you how to think to work your way around the problem that you can't solve otherwise. Uh, so for her, her particular behaviour therapy is, I shouldn't walk in front of a bus because I would die, but that, that doesn't scare me. My friends would miss me. So maybe I don't want my friends to miss me so I won't step in front of the bus and I'll just carry on about, about my life. It's not that she's suicidal or anything else like that, it's just she has no fear. The third test is during Halloween, they took her to the Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Yeah, I think this is in the US and it's basically ranked globally as the most haunted place on, but the, and most encounters with ghosts and things whether you believe in them or not. Um, they took her with a whole bunch of test subjects and basically let them loose in this old haunted asylum on Halloween at night. To make things more interesting, they got people to dress up as all sorts of scary creatures and jump out at her from, like, you know, doors and the like. She laughed. Like, everyone else was basically screaming and out of their minds, even though they knew it was a control and everything else like that. She would just see, like, someone jump out in a like, vampire outfit or something, and she'd laugh at them and say, that's, that's hilarious. Absolutely no fear whatsoever. It's really amazing. The study about her is online, so if you ever want to look up um, 
what that's about. Just look for SM amygdala um, and then you'll find out all about it. This is uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, one of the early US presidents. Um, this is a really famous quote from his uh, second induction speech. The only thing to fear is fear itself. He's completely wrong. There are lots of things that you should fear. <laughs> fear is very healthy. Otherwise, you'll end up like SM and, you know, it's bad. But scientifically, just on a tangent, she's got no fear. There are other people who have no pain as well. They have to be taught that picking up hot things is bad because you'll get a burn and then you can't do something. Um, our concepts of how we work are sometimes really odd. I'm just going to cover a couple of fears, I've got four actually, that are really relevant to us as developers. Um, fear of the unknown is a really big one. I haven't done it before, I don't like it, I immediately don't want to even have a go at it. Whenever we're confronted with a new technology, there's a new browser that comes along, there's a new framework, there's something, we don't even want to go near it. Um, and it doesn't really matter what the thing is, it just manifests in different people in different ways. This is a 1980s thing telling people, telling parents how um, basically the TV is going to destroy your mind. Uh, if you go back through history when books became widespread, when the printing press um, made books cheap enough that normal people could buy them, um, there were people complaining that, you know, all these people sitting on buses and, like, you know, uh, carrying along reading books all day like if only they engage in society a bit more it's fear of what's different we get that now when everyone's whinging about someone who's carrying a mobile phone if you're not in that mindset then that's why you're scared of it it's it's different from what you used to um, the way to get around this is to basically be uncomfortable when you are comfortable as soon as everything becomes normal you need to disrupt it um, you need to basically invoke some sense of anarchy into the way that you run your life just to throw something different at yourself. We, we revel in things being the same. We want tomorrow to be the same as yesterday. That's our, our perfect way of doing things. But the reality of that is not very good for us. Um, fear of failure is huge. Uh, it's particularly rife in some cultures more than others. But Basically, instead of trying something new, I'm just going to stick to whatever worked last time and no one's going to blame me for it going wrong. Um, the problem is that that only gets you so far. Um, this is an error message that's just handled really badly and it was funny so I thought I'd include it. <laughs> Up the top it says failure if you can't read that. Uh, basically, um, there's a precautionary principle which basically says this is the extension of fear of failure. Rather than actually um, go out there and try something different, you just have to win every time. You cannot fail. Um, the reality is you need to fail often and fast. But when you're driven by the precautionary principle, you're basically given an unfair advantage, or uh, disadvantage, sorry, um, where you can't make a mistake. So this might be a project with an unreasonably short deadline, um, inadequate resources, something along those lines where basically you're doomed from the start. Um, and the, it's actually driven from the fear of failure, which is really strange. Rather than acknowledge that something might go wrong, we just take an overly optimistic view of, of reality and push ahead with that instead. Fear inadequacy. Um, this is one that a lot of people struggle with, um, very commonly called imposter syndrome. Basically, you feel that you shouldn't be here because why am I here standing in front of you telling you about fear? What do I know? Um, I struggle with this quite often, actually. Um, and I know a lot of developers in particular get worried about, like, here I am doing this job, someone's gonna catch me out sooner or later because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, Now I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a drink break. <laughs> this is probably the hardest thing to conquer. Um, imposter syndrome, fear of uh, inadequacy. The thing that works for me is knowing that everyone's pretty much the same. 
And if you meet someone who's not really suffering from this fear of inadequacy, then you probably need to question them a little bit because maybe they don't know as much as they really do. Uh, Self-doubt is actually healthy, but yeah, you do need a measure of it. Ah. Yasu. Oh, no. Huh? It's not FOMO. FOMO? Yeah. Fear of missing out. See, I'm old. I don't know yeah. things. Fear of being old. <laughs> um, everyone else is doing it. It's got to be good. In our industry, everyone else is Google or Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or something else like that. Um, I got told that Agile, uh, sorry, not Agile, um, Angular was fantastic because Google had written it. Like, Google don't even use it, so how would they <laughs> know anything about it? But it's not a good reason to do something just because someone else is doing it. Um, because otherwise you're going to end up just like everyone else, which is probably safe and happy, but you're never really going to excel. You're just going to be average and boring and in the middle for the rest of your life. Um, basically you end up in a cargo cult situation at its worst. Um, cargo cult uh, was from World War II when the US Navy would do airdrops of supplies on Pacific Islands and basically for the, the locals who were living there hadn't really had much contact with technology these magical birds would come out of the sky drop all these wonderful things on the ground and then go away again when the war was over they wondered where the magical birds had gone so they built their own planes out of um, like the materials that they had with them in a hope that the gods would come back again. This is cargo cult. They basically worship sea containers and things like that because they had no idea what they are. We do exactly the same thing when we adopt a framework or follow someone else's suggestion without thinking about how they've done it. Um, what it wraps down to is inaction is inaction. If you just sit there and let things slide, you are actually ta you're doing something. Um, this is one of the key outcomes from the Nuremberg trials from World War II. A lot of the guards' defences in um, the concentration camps was to say that like, I was just given orders, I just did what I was told, I just followed them, I can't be blamed. The judgment from Auschwitz was that you can be blamed, that you should have stood up even if it was to be killed yourself. It's not good enough just to stand by and watch something happen. Um, and this is, there's that fear that you're going to be called out and that you'll suffer. And yeah, you've got a choice that you can either keep running and see what happens, or you can at some point look at your surroundings and hopefully change course. If we become too safe, then the rest of the world have moved on while we're still basically running off the edge of the cliff. This is basically a fair number of you may work in startups. Uh, does Vicky count as a startup? Um, maybe? No. No? Kind of, not really. You were once, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> once, yeah. The whole, the whole thing these days about startups and disruption it is all about looking for the companies that are Wiley Joyoti and trying to find out who they are and basically like taking their market from under them. Um, but every single one of us does this on an individual level where we're basically left behind on our techniques at some point or other because we're not really willing to change. How do we get around this? This is the scientific method. We can fix everything with science. If you've seen The Martian or read The Martian, then you know you can fix anything with science. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the points of the, the scientific method and how you can basically use them. So I'm not going to go through everything that's there. But go through it yourself because the scientific method's really good. The first thing you need to do is not be a piece of furniture. If you're in a meeting and you don't ever take part, then you are a piece of furniture. If you don't question the decisions that are being made, then you're just basically watching on the sidelines. You need to be careful about taking it too far. Um, if you question everything arbitrarily, you become really annoying. Um, the common term for that is a client, I think. <laughs> um, there needs to be a rationale behind your questions. You need to think about what you're doing. 
you'll get better at that when you have experience, but experience isn't everything. Um, but questioning is basically the start. You form a hypothesis that something may be different from what it is. This is from um, DigitalOcean, who are well aware that as humans we have a built-in resistance to change. This is something that Facebook found out really quickly early on. Every single time they change something, they test it out and they find that it didn't test as well as they thought it would. The reason that happened is anything is different is bad as far as humans are concerned. DigitalOcean are fantastic because they know this and they, they basically force you to click the button that says, I do not fear change when they give you the change notice. <laughs> There's no other option other than to hit that. <laughs> Research. Once you have your hypothesis, you need to basically dig a bit deeper into it. Um, that may be looking into peer review, you may be looking into a tech spec somewhere, it could be something else, you might just go for a walk and hope for an idea to pop into your head, which works. Um, you might search for something. Um, research is possibly one of the hardest things to do. You can be stuck on something for weeks, potentially, depending on what the topic is and the time and so on, especially if you're not very good at that particular area. Um, sometimes things will just pop out at you. Like, it's just immediately obvious what's going on. The value of research is it's the opposite of hippo, which is the highest paid person's opinion. And this is something that rules pretty much every single company that's going out there. Um, your boss walks in and says, no, I want to do it that way. And everyone says, okay, that's fine. <laughs> they get paid more than you do. They've never actually worked in your field whatsoever and you've just been overridden because they get paid more than you. Um, remind them of this, tell them about this when they do that and see if they stick with their decision or not. They usually do though. That's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but you do need to research. Um, opinions with nothing else are about as useful as this article. This is, there's a lot of stuff about how ads are really invasive and all over the place. This article is so bad, there's no actual content to it whatsoever. <laughs> there's a headline up the top and it's like epic slide deck from Yahoo, which is nothing. <laughs> Even if it's from somewhere else, like, yeah, you need to find out what's going on. Um, opinions can be useful because opinions can be backed based on experience and other people's research, but you need to actually provide evidence for it to ultimately win. The conversation needs to change from, I think that this should be this way, to my research, research shows that this is this way. Research should actually win, doesn't always, which is why I'm building a carousel for a site right now. Um, I spent like, hours writing up the reasons why you shouldn't use a carousel. The short answer is just don't. Um, sent it to the client, they went to their third party, the third party said, oh, I really like carousels, and they just went with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't even call the highest paid person's opinion because it doesn't count this one. But you need your references to, to back up what you're doing. So we have a hypothesis, we have a research, and now we need to actually build something. Prototyping, for me, is one of the most important things to successful programming and development. You need to go out there and just build a thing. You've got half an idea, you've done a bit of research into the different methods, you need to actually create something. Um, this is scary when you're on a really tight deadline, but if you don't do this, then you're just going to do the same thing as you did last time. The key thing when you are on a tight deadline, which is every single time, is to pick and choose which thing you're going to change this time round. So next time we're going to have a look at dropping jQuery from our project because we don't think we need it anymore. Um, the time after that we're going to drop Bootstrap because Bootstrap is bad and don't ever use it or else. Um, but you need to basically try just a little bit and, and have it fail. If you spend two days working on something that might work really well and it doesn't, that's not a bad thing. At least you've learnt something from it. Even better if you can blog about it or tell other people about it. This is Brad Bird. Um, 
he's done a movie or two that you may have heard of. Um, he's pretty awesome. One thing he said on Twitter a few months ago is that this last movie of his flopped commercially. Every single one of them prior to that was basically swept the floor of anything before it. Maybe not Ratatouille so much, but you know. He is one of the key guys behind The Simpsons as well, which you may have heard of. Um, he said, sometimes you don't know if something is going to work until you've actually gone through every single phase of it and finished it. And that's the essence of prototyping, is to try to get to that stage as soon as possible. And this is a guy who's one of the key creatives behind Pixar, who has such success out there. Even they fail, everyone will fail sometimes, but you have to be willing to have a go to get there. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with really bad things like um, Ice Age 5, I saw a preview to <laughs> it looks awful. Once you've got your prototypes, you've got a bit of a product built, you need to start testing it. This bit gets done very badly very often where someone will look at a specification, they'll see if it does the thing and then they'll just move on, it's done by rote. Um, you need imagination as a tester, you need to think about how on earth I can possibly break something. If you don't, then we have one of the many, many examples of where things have just clearly not been tested properly. Here we've got use temporary walkway, go that way, or maybe go that way. I think you need to walk through the ditch in the middle <laughs> to get to safety. I don't know. Crazy Australians. <laughs> Once you've built it, you've tested it, you've deployed it, don't let go. You need to actually review it. If you're running off um, Agile, Agile basically jumps off to the next scene and you're on to the next cycle and you never look at what you did, never look back. But you need to look back because otherwise you've created a hypothesis, uh, you've tested it out, but you don't know if it's the right answer or not. So you need to actually monitor what's going on. Software is never finished. There's going to be a bug at some point or other, or maybe you should have done something slightly differently, but you never know until you get there and you need to review it. <laughs> your users won't come to you and tell you what's wrong you need to tell them this is the ultimate point that you can be at as a software developer is when the person phones up and says hey it's broken is for you to say yeah I know and we've already got the patch ready for deployment that's this Chinese medicine guy obviously <laughs> The problem with that is that sometimes you'll have a bit of pressure. <laughs> um, but a lot of these things is basically you having the, the individual initiative to do this on your own. You will not get support. You may get support for some things, you won't get support for a lot of other things. So even though Dear Leader is looking on and, you know... Let's move a little bit to the left, click. Yeah. Um, you have to just go ahead and you know, anticipate a firing squad or something. If you don't review, then you'll never know exactly how you ended up. You won't know how successful you were. Failure is usually pretty obvious because things just don't go very well. Um, with Amazon creating the Kindle, they sent it out onto the market Every bookseller was basically in a panic thinking that the end was nigh. No one was going to buy a book anymore because why would you? You can just download it and it's there and it's fantastic. The reality is really different. The reality of the Kindle is it's actually a niche product. It's now basically plateaued at a really small level of the market amongst certain types of readers and no one else uses them. And that's fine. When Amazon created it, they created it and they threw it out there just to see what happens. You could look at it and say, well, it's not dominating the market completely, so it's a failure, but that's not correct. That's where your review process comes in and says, even though we didn't meet the original goal for whatever that was, it's still a measured success. And you'll see a lot of criticism at the moment for the Apple Watch, um, which is just done. The estimates are about 12 million sales and about 6 billion net profit. Uh, Rolex made in total four and a half billion last year, 
No one's telling Rolex that they failed. Yeah, everyone's saying that Apple did. It's all relative according to what you're doing. Apple won't tell us what they're trying to do, which probably means they think it's a failure themselves a bit, but you know. The question, what it really gets down to is what have you possibly got to lose? And if I ask you this, then you'll give me a ton of reasons. I can tell you lots of things that you've got to lose, but you've got an awful lot to lose, even if you're not aware of it. Um, this is one of the first digital SLRs that was ever created in 1989. Um, Steve Sasson was working at Kodak and he invented the digital camera in 1975. Um, he showed it to all the bosses, like he created it, gave them the funding, built the thing. I think it did about 100 pixels by 100 pixels, but you know, pretty awesome, first digital image. And they said, yes, but we're a film company, we don't do that. And sent him back to his lab, to like, carry on with it, you know, see if you can come up with something, nothing. 1989, he invents digital SLR. Every other market, every other camera maker on the market ended up making the, um, like DSLRs and what you've got in your phone these days. Um, Kodak went bust in 2012 because they just lost it. They were so obsessed with what they were trying to do that they're a film company, not a digital company, that their entire company disappeared underneath them. If you don't change, if you don't take that leap, then everything you know will be gone even before you know what's going on. Um, and this is a fictional character, and we can always trust fictional characters. Uh, until you've lost your reputation, you never realise what a burden it was. Um, in Saving Private Ryan, maybe more fiction. Um, there's talk about what makes makes a successful soldier, and basically, if you want to be a successful soldier, you have to assume you've already been killed. If you sit there on the battlefield and want to save your life, you're in the wrong spot because everyone's trying to kill you. If you assume that you're already dead, then you can do anything, and this is pretty much how you need to go. Without at the same time. Um, you're forgetting that you've got a mortgage or something like that, of course. We've lost so many musical legends this year, I can't really avoid quoting one of them. And this is Bowie, who made me really upset when he died. Um, so I, I don't know where I'm going either. Um, I don't know where I'm going from here, but I promise it won't be boring. And this is basically the attitude that you need if you want to be not average and not vanilla and not dull that you need to push yourself into that discomfort zone um, and do something different. Thank you. Anyone with questions about fear? <laughs> No scary questions for me. <laughs> I have these slides up on uh, SlideShare, so if you do want to have a look at them, then please go ahead. After you told me not to use SlideShare. Yeah, I know. I've, I've already got so many things on there. It's, it's my fear of leaving the rest behind. <laughs> yeah. So how long how long you have been so far with this video before you found this uh, solution? Um, this talk was... Like, we had a thing at my work where we had to do a talk based on our little section and I had to do one on UX and I thought about what, what's UX actually about and UX is basically applying the scientific method to stuff and then it was like well what's the scientific method really do it's like for developers and you know, that kind of thing it's really about getting rid of fears it helps you not worry about stuff like that um, so it's a really random reason that I'm up here talking today. This talk actually got cancelled because I was sick and then couldn't finish it in time. Um, so then, since we had no one else speaking tonight, I thought I'd polish it off. Um, it basically was a bit of introspection for myself and one of my co-workers thinking about the things that we face within our jobs um, and what we can actually do about them. I, it's not me standing up here and saying I'm perfect at anything because you know everyone fails at everything sooner or later but it's just basically things that have helped in the past it's like I was talking about cognitive behaviour therapy this is basically our own developer cognitive behaviour therapy yeah. 
It's really, actually very interesting topic because the fear is everything we face in different ways. Yes. As, as the part. So, yeah, you, 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 your presentation is really useful for us. Thank right. you. Good. Yeah. Just like a philosophical discussion, the idea of fear is very scary because you can't measure it, it's unknown, and mm -hmm. therefore it is scary, so you're disproportionate. But otherwise, if you think about it, fear is actually nothing because there's nothing there but your imagination. Yeah, it's entirely in the mind. Yeah. yeah. Very I wonder what that person without fear would be like as a software developer. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just build it. Nothing could go wrong. It'd be fine. Who needs backups? It'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need source control. That's what you have test servers for. Yeah. But it's always about the balance because you like, talking about not having fear is wrong, which is why I did the intro with SM. So I'd, I'd heard about her before. And you don't want to be without fear. Fear is really important you still need to know what your fears actually are. What are the things that are holding you back? And you won't get it right every time because when something new comes along, you will be scared of that change. But when you're aware that you're scared of the change, then you can actually do something about it. If you're not, then you can't. If you believe that you can reverse the change, you kind of know yourself really well, and you know like, yeah. hey, I can reverse change to this level, then you really take that amount of risk to change that bit. Yeah. And for people with phobias, that's exactly what they do, the desensitization, basically. So you try something new. Um, for me, like conquering my fear of heights has yeah. involved me. I climbed to the top of Sydney Harbour Bridge. My legs were gone. Yeah. I, yeah, I was a mess, but I did it. Um, having done that, I climbed to the top of a tower in Sydney and you know how when they look glass? And, you, and there's nothing yeah. and that's really bad and I walked on that and it wasn't as bad but yeah it's even scary talking about that stuff yeah, I did the same thing for heights because I had a very I mean um, not as much better I'm still afraid of heights but then like, I went skydiving and all this stuff oh. yeah, so <laughs> no, because if you think about it sometimes fear makes things that much so fear is an emotion of a certain magnitude right so you can put it to your positive use if you put it to negative use so if you fear something very much, it makes it that much more exciting. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you take it and reverse it around, it makes it that much more exciting. Well, there's so one, of, one of the things and the reasons that I, that one of the things that helped me tackle my fear of heights was um, science. Yay, mm -hmm. science. Um, the study into like how the brain works when you're scared. The only difference between someone on a roller coaster who's really enjoying themselves and me is there's a switch in the brain. The things that are happening are exactly the same. Your pulse rate is up, your eyes, are like you're basically really wired. One person is petrified, the other one's having the time of their lives. I have the really bad fortune of having a son who loves roller coasters, a wife who has a, a couple of rods down her back that prevents her from going on them, and dear old dad who has to go with him. Um, luckily, I'm not that bad at those things anymore, but I still find it pretty scary. Mm. But yeah, th there's no difference between fear and excitement other than what your brain tells you that you're experiencing. But you pre-program yourself before you do it. Yeah, that's uh, priming. Yeah. Um, I was doing, I'm doing a, um, running a thing at the moment on um, waiting times and progress indicators and things like that. And the psych on that is basically you prepare someone for what's happening next. When you are scared of something and you know it, you're preparing yourself to be scared. Mm -hmm. When you are prepared for it and you've got a different tactic to try this time around, then you're going to have a better chance of success. Yeah, uh, the other thing is the, the way how we, we see the problem. So basically, we, we, we're afraid of fear because we think this is something we cannot do. Yeah. That if we can change the way, okay, we can maybe we, 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 we lie ourselves, okay, I can do this. And then we can start get the motivation to fight the, the fear. I think that's called reframing something. And just the reframing thing. Reframing? I don't know. Really <laughs> <laughs> Google it. <laughs> and no, I've not, I I've not been through C B T or any call, but is that all the channels can make man. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. if we can convert our mind, if the, there's a problem, 
instead of afraid, instead of fear, we can make this not happen. I mean, something benefit of man. Then definitely we can change to to fight this this fear. Yeah. And Monty Python has a very good quote that like, I mean, we came from nothing, we go back to nothing after all. Sounds very Buddhist. No, that. <laughs> very cool. Since we're on quotable quotes, I don't know how many <laughs> people are involved in like martial arts, but if you have ever sparred with anybody, you will know that if someone's gonna hit you in the face, right? <laughs> it's, it's actually to 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 step into a a situation where you have to spar another person, right? Voluntarily, right? Actually, it is quite scary, and the 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 the, the matter of fact is. It, I want some fighters said this. Can't remember who, but the fact is that courage is not the absence of fear. It's acting in spite of fear, which is to say that you you like what Chris said. You can't you can't function without fear. But what the I think the measure of yourself is can you do something in spite of being scared? I think that's that's the key. The expectation is not to have no fear, mm. but but to act in spite of it. I guess that's that's that. Yeah, my subject man, is a lie. <laughs> my subject, <laughs> it's not no fear. Have some fear, but not too much. Anyone else yeah. before we get into wrap up? No wrap up time. You should okay. tell just this bit of uh, motivational speech. No, no, in conclusion, you should come and speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to that, it's alright. Okay.